Julia's work is like using a single word to convey a, a complex sentence of sort. And, and a specific thing with Julia's work, I think, is that with her work, she creates conditions for the content to really speak its own language uh, from within and with a voice that uh, we could not access in uh, another way. So it's, it's really an amazing skill in the craft and curious with precision and, and creates this synergetic and fundamental conversation between content and the design. Working with Julia, it's, it's often that, I, I mean, I, I don't really care, you know, in which role we are working, the division is not so uh, clear because the discussion is primarily a discussion about content, which is mediated through images and texts. So this is how we apprehend content. We need images and text to, to get somewhere. We are not using telepathy <coughs> yet. For her, it's very important to have an interesting conversation at the start of a project. Something that really triggers her, that challenges her, something that really makes it worth doing. I think she needs a, a conversation partner. When you're approached by someone with whom you haven't worked before, how do you gauge whether to enter into what will obviously become such a long relationship? What inspires you to work with someone and how does your process typically begin? Well, the beginning point of each, the starting point of each collaboration is a conversation. The first conversation is kind of like trying to assess expectations, trying to capture the brief or the, the project, and then sometimes also redefining it or rewriting a brief. The most important thing is that there is a kind of, there is a, a common ground, like which eventually will be the playground in which this conversation is taking place or the, the collaboration is taking place and it's and it, it's not necessarily kind of I'm looking for consensus or, or, or agreement. When I feel like people really don't know me or the way I work, I do feel the need to um, um, uh, yeah, talk a bit about my involvement as a designer or ask maybe about previous experiences because I feel the way I work can be quite demanding or also challenging in the sense that I, I, I want to be involved on a content level, on an editorial level. You sometimes work for years developing a project and I wonder what is the longest time that you've spent on any single project? The longest projects are probably the ones I did with Uta Eisenreich a photographer and artist based in Amsterdam. We studied at, in the same class in graphic design and we already, during our studies, we shared a lot of common interests. The first book we did together was A Not B and it took us about three years to make. And the one that we're working on now, which is the second volume called As If, we're in conversation about that book since eight years and since I would say four years or something, we're really working on it on and off. So those interests, they, they are how in language and how language is acquired and taught. Like we both have a, an obsession with like primary school books and uh, in, like sources that we also exchange. And the way, the way we are taught to read and write and speak is also in a way shapes the way we are reading the world. And that's quite a special working collaboration process if I have together with Uta and um, the, uh, during having the conversations of these books, she's producing work as we go along. During these eight years, 
she's been making work and she's been producing new images. Every time I came to Amsterdam, I saw new images. And even now that we are supposed to be in the final phase, she's still, she's still making, producing images. It's almost a bit like filling the gaps. And it reminds me sometimes a little bit of this um, way of working of, you know, Samuel Beckett, who was sort of like finishing his theatre pieces on stage with the actors. So it, it feels a bit that's what we're doing. And as we go and as we, as we build up this narrative and the sequence, she's sort of like identifying the missing images and produces them. And that's, it's a bit like pu puzzling, making a puzzle consisting of 5,000 pieces over eight years. The work with Uta is not a typical commission. It's, uh, would say, disproportionately time-consuming. Um, but the books at the end are really precisely distilled, I would say. And it's a bit like, it feels like all of our conversations are boiled down to this one take that is very sort of carefully edited. And I think that's probably also visible in, yeah, in the books. I sometimes also engage in ongoing commissions for identities and cultural institutions, such as CASCO, that's a project space in Utrecht, or the Brücke Museum in Berlin, both in collaboration with Laurence Brunner, and most recently the Rijksakademie in Amsterdam that I work on with Linda van Dersen. The most extensive one in this respect might be Documenta 14. That was quite a special experience involving many artists and writers, curators, from Adam Shimchik's written proposal to two fully realized exhibitions in Athens and Kassel, like three years later, which involved hundreds of people working together. That was a very, very intense experience. What remains in the end is a box of printed objects in the website that is partly out of service and that's in no relation to the significance and the intensity of the project and also the insights and relationships I gained through it. People that um, work within this field are naturally willing to engage in such discussions and willing to invest and will willing to, um, to produce work on on a rather high level. You know, when you think about her work, it's always rather precise and but at the same time when you work with her there's also quite an element of improvisation and of something quite spontaneous that she is always able to keep in the work something which is not so controlled but it looks very convincing she's looking for something simple without it being boring and without it being obviously pleasing and beautiful this is, this is very important to her. Julia's um, interest in structure is not pedantic and paranoid, but it is, it's kind of organic. You know, she, she sort of feels that in this structure you can, you, can, you can sense what you will encounter as you go into the, the, the fabric, the matter of the book. Regardless of the media, uh, her work embodies this uh, rare sensation when you realize what is possible to experience through design. And, and when you realize how complex it is, um, that all these details have a specific function and there's, they are there on purpose. The span of your entire career uh, from around late 90s, early 2000s to now, roughly coincides with a profound technological change that has um, completely upended uh, these, these processes and lowered the barriers to entry so that um, you know, anyone uh, with a network connection and a smartphone can uh, design and publish online instantly and cheaply. So as someone who is dedicated in, any, in many ways to a slower production cycle, I wonder what you think about the transformations now underway and how this affects the, the economies of your work. I guess it's about 
how you do something and, and um, yeah, like why we do something. And I would say um, that it's probably about recognizing or distinguishing fast from slow content because I absolutely, I don't uh, only support or, or I'm not also only producing, let's say, slow uh, design. I'm also really, I really love like uh, short-lived, ephemeral, superficial, formally beautiful, striking things that may have uh, a shorter uh, lifespan or, 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 or expir uh, an expiration date, let's say. But I think it's probably, it comes down to being able to sort of like sit with something, to analyze it, to understand it, to digest it. And I guess that's, that's what I would, what I'm trying to do to actually be also able to, to do both. Graphic designers exercise agency and uh, are active forces in the process of shaping content. So we spoke about a book that is being made over eight years, but of course there's also things that I produce faster, much faster. I believe that the time that is invested in an object does remain visible or perceptible when you hold it in your hands. And I think that the care and uh, the dedication, and that doesn't matter if it's analog or digital, makes a thing valuable and relevant. Adam once said that he's interested in, more interested in stubborn repetition rather than formal innovations, which I think is, a, is an interesting uh, observation in the sense that all the errors and irritations that occur in the process of repetition can be as interesting as something new. So conflict, uncertainty, dissonance uh, could be seen as enemies of an efficient working method, but they, they allow for, let's say, a layered, more layered perspective or like multitudes of perspective. Um, as opposed to just one assured truth. So I was thinking about title of the show because the experience of the person in the exhibition is almost as if being inside of a spatial um, translation of a book and then the, the publication that was produced after the installation of the exhibition translates um, architectural photography of the exhibition itself back into book form. So there's this this cycle of of um, of I think thinking about space um, through both book design and um, architectural installation or theatrical production, where it, it becomes a, a dialogue between those those platforms. Mm -hmm. What is also striking is this idea of like the time based. Um the time-basedness of uh, performance and, uh, you know, like all these, the, the, the dimension of time, the dimension of space, all these dimensions. And then the book, which you could say is a, is an, a medium that is more limited, but maybe through it being limited, I'm really interested in also like exploring those limitations and maybe opening up uh, with interventions, opening up possibilities of how uh, maybe the way you can read a book can be interrupted or disrupted or, or changed or manipulated. So in that sense, the idea of like uh, this narrative of like beginning and ending and so on, there is a lot of, um, there is a lot of, uh, let's say, common um, characteristics within performance and choreography and graphic design. The work uh, in collaboration with Alexandra Bartzetsis, she's an artist and choreographer, it's rooted in, a, in an interest, a shared interest in language. And um, we know each other for many years. She studied in Brussels while I was in Amsterdam and we sort of for more than two decades have been collaborating on many different projects. In 2005, she asked me to be part of the work Secret Instructions that we conceived together. And that's a performance piece uh, where we isolated the stage directions of six different theater pieces. 
and reformulated them into instructions. So we were kind of interested in the implicit and explicit nature of language and how that would translate to movements on stage. A few years later, we did something related to that. It's a piece called This Side Up that is revolving around language too or the fundamental shortcomings of our language. When we say up, down, left, right, this sort of spatial orientation that are rather ambiguous as terms. So we were interested in, the, in these um, descriptions of space and I designed a score that Alexandra eventually interpreted as movement and we flipped the camera while filming her, so it, you would lose a sense of gravity by, you don't know anymore whether she's crawling on the floor or ceiling or wall. And uh, the movement she created was also in relation to the idea of ambiguity. Maybe a big part of the work I'm doing is, is trying to get down to the essence of something and therefore also get rid of a lot of the unnecessary content or, you know, things around something. I'm, I'm trying to really like um, distill something down and that often results in, in clear looking or simple looking design. Even though I think this could be deceiving in the way that it's not just about a reduced thing. That form may be clear and minimal and re reduced, but I'm interested in uh, in much more like irritation as well, or multi-layeredness or complexity. How, um, as you work with people over a long period of time, how would you say your, your own work, um, you carry from project to project, from person to person, the kind of um, impression of, of working with each of these people who approach language and image so differently? What I often try to do is to kind of like look at and study somebody, somebody's work, somebody's references or methodologies and try to sort of find ways to, uh, find ways to translate that into, into an object or into a layout, into a way of reading content. With Wendelin, I, Wendelin van Oldenborg, she's a Dutch fil artist and filmmaker. I made a monograph uh, that featured 10 of her films alongside research material and that included um, scripts or books, ephemera, there were also dialogues of the films, the installation images. So it's a kind of polyphonic material that was shown, let's say, alongside um, the representation of the films. So I had the idea to cut the pages horizontally that you would never see the book in the same way. So whenever you flip through it, you see different images recomposing themselves. And this sort of openness that it created was something that I wanted to achieve with a material intervention in the book. And that's something that I'm trying also to, in general, to find ways in, in which also like material or the object itself can translate a method of working of an artist. Moira's methods of narrating and editing, I'm really fascinated by. Um, she's both a writer and a reader. If you make that connection to the title of the book, The Speaker and the Receiver, which is in general a very interesting metaphor for my own profession as a graphic designer. In this book, uh, the blank spaces were there to sort of pause the text whenever an, an image is displayed and then resuming with the text on the following page. So I was interested in building a framework from a relationship between a blank page and silence and that representing presence and absence, which is inherent in her work. With Shannon, I made uh, the book called A Public Character, which involved a series of A's that she photographed over years and that needed a place of display. Shannon sees and uses language like as literal material, substance, like substance matter, something with a body or a physical presence. And uh, the letter A, according to her, manifests itself a bit like a human body with legs, like standing firmly on the ground. This relationship of 
typographic terminology to human metaphors, as in like type or character or family or typeface, was also part of our conversations. Like another meaning of the letter A is this the indefinite article, and we had also conversations about ambiguity and the potential that lies within there like something which is not entirely clear or resolved that was materialized also in the way we documented the work uh, a public character we took pictures of the film with a slow shutter speed which resulted in this sort of double or multiple exposures in which we could capture this multi, this overlayering and um, the layered time that is quite an important aspect in her work. I then tried to also kind of counter-react and maybe like um, intentionally seek these moments of irritation or maybe also like, yeah, something that is not so directed and like in a, going in a clear direction, but also kind of like drifting a bit. The book about Elisabeth Wild's collages called Fantasias, I did in collaboration with uh, Adam Schimczyk. You could say it reads like a piece of fabric and uh, maybe kind of weaving together her life and work. She was a trained textile designer herself. And in this book, we try to, to capture her spirit with colors we chose for the papers or the, the range of texts, the scope of texts that Adam commissioned to capture her and the work. And uh, there is also this sort of rather brutal decision of cutting the book at the fore edge or the hand cut square on the cover that are all sort of, they relate to the idea of the, this manual labor that is put into the work. The images were carefully selected and, and sequenced by, by Adam and myself, and we sort of tried to work along narratives or themes that go through her work. And what is quite interesting is the fact that for the first time, I didn't have a grid or I, I placed all the works by eye since none of these collages have a straight angle. So it was really all about sort of intuitively placing the work and constructing the book. The scene of, of her focusing on her daily practice really moves me. Rather than kind of um, trying to smooth that over to produce a confident object, um, that, that you want to bring in the, the flexibility and the ambiguity of the, the, the process, which is a process of co-adaptation with the other people that you're collaborating with, and have that survive in the produced object. Generally, the act of designing is just basically going through a list of a thousand of questions. It's like one question after another, answering, answering, answering. But maybe I do want to achieve with the work, maybe in the reader or the, the viewer, uh, to produce maybe doubt as a, as a kind of way of engaging the viewer and not just think like, ah, oh, I got it and that's it. In a way, it's the opposite of reassurance. I'm not trying to reassure the viewer, I think, if I can put it this way. It's, it's exciting to work with her and it's exciting to, to have the conversation about work. I think that often working with Julia, there is this point where uh, the question of, you know, where is the content and which shape is going to be given to it is, is kind of changing into, uh, I would say, um, how to understand uh, the content through, uh, through the means uh, of design. It's just exceptional, I think, to, to be able to create such a place. And it's like an authorship of experience, really. <laughs> Thank you.